Welcome to your weekly UAS news update, and this is week 57. And this week I only have two topics, but one of them is actually really important. Uh, and, and that topic is actually the Drone Advisory Committee that met on Friday of last week regarding remote ID and regarding UTM. And I, I want to keep you updated on what happened. And then the next thing is actually an update from the FAA on registration for hobbyists. So if you're a hobbyist, this is something that you also want to hear. So let's get started. <music> So the big topic this week, and quite frankly, the, the rest of the news has been fairly boring, so this is actually kind of timely. But last week on Friday, the Drone Advisory Committee met online, actually, and you were able to watch it. Now, there was only about 200 to 250 people that watched this thing live, including myself, because I wanted to hear what they had to say. Now, if you're not familiar, the Drone Advisory Committee is something that the FAA put together, and they invited a bunch of uh, professionals from the industry, supposedly, uh, to talk about what we should be doing going forward with several topics. So each of these committees are put together and, um, and then they have a task and they need to uh, kind of uh, respond to the task and come up with a summary. And this is kind of what this meeting was all about. Uh, the meeting was, I think, about an hour and a half long with uh, maybe a little bit less actually and a 15 minute break in between, which I thought was funny. Uh, they talked for 30 minutes, took a 15 minute break and then talked again for another half hour or so uh, when we could have done all this in an hour and be done with it. But anyway, uh, I'm getting off track. What came out of it, really, the biggest thing that I, that I got out of it is came out really early in the meeting is the fact that the FAA is getting ready to release final ruling for remote ID in December of 2020. Now, I kind of hinted at this a couple weeks ago uh, when somebody had leaked some information, but this came straight from the FAA. So they're finally getting ready to uh, have something. And this is going to be about a year after they released the NPRM, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Now, if you're new to the drone world, uh, you may have missed this whole thing, but if you're not, you, you, you heard me talking about this. I actually uh, spent pretty much my whole entire winter break uh, going through this document and writing a really, really long post about what the NPRM was and all the different information. I'm going to put a link down here if you're interested in this and you haven't seen it yet. But with that being said, um, at the end of uh, this NPRM notice of proposed rulemaking, the FAA asked people to leave comments. And there was a period to leave comments that ended at the end of March. And uh, the FAA collected 50,000 comments from you and I and people that were uh, mostly concerned with what the FAA had proposed. Now, the FAA in the last pretty much two and a half to three months went through 50,000 comments, supposedly, because if you think about it, uh, if you look at the timeline, this is about 60 days, 60 working days roughly uh, that the FAA took to go through all these comments. If you uh, do the math, and I don't recommend that you do, you'll get very cynical uh, like I am right now, and that's about 800 comments a day that the FAA went through. Uh, obviously, there is no way that they could have done that and taken anything that people are talking about in these comments, which makes me really sad. I had hoped, um, maybe false hope, I'm not sure, that the FAA would take this seriously. Now, we don't know what the final ruling is going to be. A lot of people ask a lot of actually really good questions, I thought, during the DAC. The, this was, by the way, uh, the comments were from other DAC members, not from the public. There were no comments from the public that were uh, taken, no questions that were taken. Um, but some people were asking tough questions, and, um, and all of them were basically, the answer was, well, you'll see when the final ruling comes out, which, uh, which is just, well, interesting to say the least. Uh, there were discussions on the uh, UTM. UTM is the, the general unmanned traffic management system that the FAA is kind of going after with having remote ID put in place. Uh, the, the bottom line, and something that I kind of, uh, it feels like they hinted at it without saying it directly, but it almost feels like they want to know everything about every drone flying in the airspace. Uh, this is not something that I'm necessarily for. Uh, if you're flying in class golf airspace, I live uh, in the West, uh, as some of you know, in Prescott, Arizona, which surrounds me is a lot of nothing. There is a lot of uncontrolled airspace where you can just go and fly. Why do I need to tell anyone that I'm going to be flying under 400 feet if I'm going to be in the middle of the desert uh, surrounding Prescott, Arizona? But uh, So I hope I'm wrong. There was no real uh, specific... Uh, information saying that this is what's going to happen, but one of the statements that was made in there kind of made me feel like this is what they were hinting at, which uh, which is not new. Uh, we've, we've heard uh, other people talking about this topic as well in the past. 
Um, a few disappointments from the meeting. As you can tell, I'm not really all that positive about what happened in that meeting, but uh, Joe DePete, he's the president of ALPA. ALPA is the Airline Pilot Association. Uh, he's one of the DAC member, and he took a large portion of the meeting actually talking about uh, a variety of different things. One of them that I really liked is he's talking about a learning focused environment for uh, drone pilots. And this is something that I've also been advocating myself coming from the flight training world, having done this my whole life. This is something that works. We need to train our pilots. We need to train drone pilots just like we train uh, airplane pilots to be safe. And, and, and we can't accomplish that without having a, a structure that is gonna be focused on learning. Now, with that being said, he also spent a lot of time just congratulating his friends on the DAC uh, committee and, um, and talking about these pillars, these pillars of operation that they put in place, which in my opinion, quite frankly, have already been put in place by a lot of very serious commercial operators out there. If you're doing this for a living and if you've been doing this for a while, this is already something that you do, safety first. And, and you can't operate in this world without being safety oriented and be, being safety first. So um, he kept bragging about the safety record of the airlines, which, you know, it is a good record. It is a good safety record based on the training that they've done over the years and based on the changes that they've made over the years. But what it really shows to me is a lack of understanding of the UAS industry as a whole. Unfortunately, most of these uh, DAC members are not pilots. They're not remote pilots. He's an airline pilot, which is fine. I have a lot of respect for that. I'm a manned aircraft pilot myself. But he obviously doesn't really understand the industry and that I think is taking away a lot of their credibility when they start talking about making the industry safer. The industry does not need to be safer. It's already extremely safe. As pointed by Brandon Schulman, who's the DJI representative who was in there, and he's the only one that actually took over and basically said, hey, listen, this is really nice that you guys want to make this safer, but think about the fact that there's been no fatalities related to drones since inception, since this all started. So um, so we have to go back and look and, and take this with a grain of salt, I think. And I was extremely disappointed that they would go in there and kind of try to hammer a safety culture when obviously we already have a safety culture. Now, I'm not saying that the drone world is perfect because it's not. Uh, we still have people that are doing stupid things as we can see every single day. Uh, not every single day, I shouldn't say that. Uh, as we can see very often online with people posting videos that are um, hiffy and, and doing dangerous things. And the most recent one was with the Blue Angels, the, the video that surfaced of that person trying to film the Blue Angels. But anyway, so um, bottom line with all this, this meeting was... Um, Quite interesting. Uh, I, I didn't see anyone actually coming out to talk about the uh, FPV community, which I wish there was. I know there were people in there. I don't know them by name. I don't really know exactly who they represent, but I know some people in the comments were uh, hinting at the fact that this person kind of stayed silent the whole time, not talking about the FPV community, which is really going to be affected uh, big time by, by these changes when they, when they happen, if they happen as published in the NPRM. So uh, thank you, Brendan, Brendan Schulman from DJI, who really was the only person out there that kind of stood up and said, hey, listen, this, this is not the industry that uh, some of you guys are trying to portray. And we don't really need all of this of, uh, uh, heavy regulation because heavy regulation means that most people are not gonna follow the rules because it's just gonna to be too burdensome. And if that happens, then remote ID is gonna be a failure, which I totally agree with. This is something that needs to be simple. We are not only talking about people that are gonna be flying for a living, but we're also gonna be talking about people that are gonna be flying for fun. And if we stifle this, then this is not gonna work. We're gonna lose a lot of people in this industry and lose a lot of interest, not only in the UAS world, but I want people to think about that. Flying drones, flying uh, paper airplane, flying anything that really is remote control is usually a gateway to becoming a pilot, an airplane pilot. And this is something that we need to keep to keep the next generation interested in flying and, and, and in being in aviation. So with that being said, I'm going to get off my soapbox and, uh, and I'm going to hope for the best. I'm really going to hope that the FAA has listened to these comments and that they have seen enough of them and that maybe they went through because they realized that this was a major a flawed proposal and that they're working it to be something a little bit more uh, applicable. I know some of you are going to be <laughs> saying that I'm dreaming and I hope I'm not. I'm going to stay positive until December, until this comes out and then, um, and then we'll go from there. I'll definitely keep you guys posted. This is a hot topic and this is definitely something that I want to keep 
uh, on the radar and keep talking about as it comes up. The next topic is FA registration for hobbyists. The FA a while back had uh, released a statement. Let me give you actually the backstory. This would be probably a little bit easier. Back in 2016, when you could register your drone, when you had to register your drone as a hobbyist, you went online and you paid you $5, you get a certificate. And then all of a sudden, somebody sued the government and said, you can't do that. You can't require people from, uh, you, you can't require people to register their drones. So the FA pulled that back and then went back to creating regulation and then they came back and said, hey, guess what? Now you have to register again and now it's legal. So in the meantime, they had said, well, if you registered back in 2016, uh, if you want your money back, your $5, you can have your money back and you don't have to register anymore. And then when this all came back, they said, well, now you have to give us your $5 again and you have to register again. Um, they gave me the option. I had a drone, I had my, uh, my stuff registered and I said, I don't want my $5 back. It might not worth my time, quite frankly. And um, so they had extended. Mine was supposed to expire uh, in 2019 sometime. I don't remember the exact date. But recently, a couple months ago, the FAA said, hey, guess what? We're actually going to extend this. If you register way back in 2016 and you didn't ask for your $5 back, we're going to extend your registration until uh, December 12 of 2020. Okay, so December 12 of 2020 is right around the corner. So the FAA sent a message recently, uh, last week, and they said, if your registration expires December 12 of 2020, you can renew your registration today. All right, so today I actually went online, today being a couple days ago. Um, I went online and I registered mine. I extended it because I wanted to see what the process looked like. And uh, what you get is you have 180 days before the registration expires where you can renew the registration without losing anything. So I registered today, uh, end of uh, June, and my number stayed the same. So your hobbyist number remains the same. If you've had it for three years, four years, whatever it is, uh, then it, it's still the same number. And then uh, you get another three years on top of it. So my initial expiration date was December 12, 2020. Now the new registration, the new expiration of my registration is December 12, 2023, three years later. Okay, so I'm good for three years. Even though I did it early, then when you extend it, it keeps the original expiration date and it adds three years to it. I hope this clarifies it. I hope that this doesn't confuse you. Um, if you're not sure, Go to the FA Drone Zone website, find, log in in there, go to your um, hobbyist registration and then see when it expires. It will tell you. If you've been doing this for a while and you were one of the first ones to register back in 2016, the registration expiration is going to be December 12, 2020. You can go ahead and re-register or extend your registration, I should say, and then, and then be good again for three years. So um, that was long story short. Okay, this is all I have really for this week. Oh, actually, no, I'm, I, I take that back. I wanted to add one more thing. Uh, when you get the email from the FA, and this is a point of confusion that I see almost uh, every day in people asking us questions at Pilot Institute, um, there's no test at the moment for hobbyists. Now I'm recording this in, in June. If, if you watch this video in the future, this is June of 2020. The FA still has not come up with a test for hobbyists, but, you're gonna get an email from the FAA that says that you need to pass a test. It says, pass an aeronautical knowledge and safety test. Because this is in the books for regulation. It's already part of the regulation, but the FAA hasn't put that in place. So if you see this, just disregard for right now until the FAA comes up with that test. But at the moment, it is not there. It does not exist. Okay, so I just wanted to add this and, and clarify it. I know we have a lot of people that watch and follow us that are hobbyists and I have just started with this. Uh, so it may be kind of confusing at first, but the FA does not have a hobbyist test. The only test that they have is the commercial drone pilot test, the, the remote pilot test that you have to take if you're gonna do this for commercial purposes. Okay, so just wanted to get that out there. Um, I wanted to thank you guys, 4,000 subscribers. We just hit that uh, last week, at the end of last week. So I'm really excited. More and more people follow us every day and, uh, and I love the comments, love interacting with you. I know I say this every week, but I really mean it. Uh, a lot of very insightful comments, actually. I, I, I really love that you guys are into this and, and asking a lot of really good questions. So I'm happy to answer them. I'm here to educate and help you uh, succeed in your uh, drone career. So with that being said, like, subscribe, do all the good stuff that you usually do, and then I'll talk to you guys next week.